everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're coming at you live tonight from Hoss Headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. We're excited to have you with us tonight. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we've got a great show planned for tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about our favorite crops and our favorite varieties of those crops to grow in fall. We've got uh, lots of stuff that's leaving the greenhouse, leaving the seed trays going into the garden this these last few weeks and these next few weeks we want to tell you what we like to grow and uh because there's still plenty of time to get some seeds started and get some stuff out there yeah you know now's the time school starting back different places everybody's got a lot of different things on the mind but it's actually time to think about fall gardening this is the ideal time to get some of those cold crops in the ground for this fall and for this winter that's right and so um, we'll have our usual show and tell segment here in a second. We're, as always, we're going to answer some of our viewer questions at the end of the show. If you have any questions during the show, put those in the comments and uh, you'll be the recipient if we answer your question of a nice little surprise gift. Yep. Um, so if you have any questions, put those in the comments and we will get to them next week. So uh, for our show and tell, what I wanted to show, and I showed these on my two minute tip I did but I kind of wanted to revisit a little bit these are these Christmas lima beans here you can get an idea how big these babies are these things are pretty good size they also come in green just a regular green you can get a running butter green running butter bean yep. so these are pole bean or running butter bean and uh, the ones I planted on that two minute tip I've got some already a foot foot and a half tall they're starting to climb up the trellis now these make a good fresh eating butter bean now when you shell them fresh the the beans will just be kind of a gray color they don't get this speckled kind of dark red color until you let them dry but they also make a really good dried bean that's something i've never done i've only eat them fresh so you can freeze them you can you know, blanch them and freeze them like you do any other bean or you can let them dry like this and uh, keep them up and make some really good soups in the wintertime yep. with them as well. And I've been growing those green, those running butter beans for years and years and years. We used to go cut green bamboo, which we have a couple of patches in the nearby, uh, I'll say down, nearby down the road of bamboo, wild bamboo. And used to, we'd go cut us some bamboo, make us a tripod and grow them up on those tripods. Since then, we've kind of changed our strategy a little bit and we grow them on a cow panel trellis now. Yeah, I remember those years. We got a little overzealous, and uh, they got too tall. We couldn't get up there to pick yep. them. Yep. Cut our bamboo. That's the tall. problem with the bamboo. But you know, we got a little carried away with our bamboo, didn't we? <laughs> with our TP. That's right. That's right. And uh, we've got a lot of transplants in the greenhouse too that we're going to be showing. Let's give them a little update on the fall potato situation. It ain't good. It ain't good at all. We have had what they call a failure, and against my better judgment somebody else really wanted to put our seed potatoes in the refrigerator and we did need to slow them down so that they wouldn't sprout as much so we put them in the refrigerator we put a hundred pounds of seed potatoes in the refrigerator to hold them till we got time ready to plant them well we took them out when we took them out i knew we was in trouble because they didn't look right to me well we cut them up got our beds ready and we planted them it took us a half day to get everything planted and then babies have what rotted in the ground and here's where, we came, where our trouble came in at, is we shouldn't have stored them in a refrigerator because of the humidity. Temperature would have been fine, but the humidity was dropped down so low in a refrigerator, your, your, your humidity normally is gonna be close to what your temperature is in a refrigerator. And to store potatoes properly, you need a very high humidity. So do not store your seed potatoes in the refrigerator. You're better off just putting them in a cool, dry place out and sacrifice a little temperature difference for that humidity difference to leave them out that way than you are to put them in the refrigerator. That was a boo-boo when we learned our lesson. Cost us a good bit of work, a hundred pound of sweet uh, ice taters, seed taters, but uh, we have learned our lesson. Well, not so fast. Uh-oh. Not so fast because it might have cost us 50 pounds, but I checked mine last night. Now they're not coming up from the ground but they're not rotted <clears throat> and I got buds about that long and they're about to come up out of the ground. Now mm -hmm. what I haven't done that I noticed you did is I haven't put any water on mine. 
So, well, I did water them a little bit, but not a lot, but a little bit I did water. And I was planting in a wetter area. However, I still says, my bet says you ain't going to be satisfied with your tater crop. But right. we'll see. I, the ones I checked last night, um, I was you had, you had gotten me doubting myself and everything. Well, I just couldn't stand myself. I've been scratching at them seed taters for about three weeks now. Every day I scratch down there and see how they sprout and come up because I'm not known for my patience. And the ones I've checked, the majority of them had rotted. Mm. And that just got me, got me down and a little discouraged. Well, I hadn't gotten any, mine looking good so far, so let's, uh, let's just leave that jury out there and we'll mm. see how they go. Well, I'm gonna give up on my little patch. Okay. And we're gonna go ahead and do something different. But we'll wait and see how yours does, because I'm almost positive. Now, I did see one or two coming up this morning, but they're gonna be so far, Skippy and far in between, it's not going to be worth trying to save them. So I'm going to go ahead and scratch that air off, and I'm going to do something different there. I think, I think what we, I, I think we can grow them in the fall. But I think what we need to do next year is grow twice as many taters as we're going to need, and use our spring crop for fall seed taters. Oh, no doubt we can grow them in the fall. Our problem is going to be storing them, like you said, until that fall crop goes. The majority of the seed potatoes are grown in this country in cold climates, such as Maine, Washington State, up in that area there. And they're just now, potatoes are coming off. So they don't have to store them near as long and they don't have near the humidity con conditions that we have here in the South. So storing those potatoes is definitely our issue. Yeah. And um, one last thing for a show and tell, I got corn about, I'd say a foot and a half tall, getting ready to heal. And at the expo, we're getting ready to plant corn. We're going to plant corn this week. And so, uh, sweet corn's looking good. Yep. I planted my corn in a spot that's been staying a little too wet for me, and it, it's going to soak it right up. Oh, way. yeah. I noticed the uh, commercial guys, the big farmers right here, got sweet corn up by this high and lots of it. So, uh, corn still got time to make in zone eight, but it's getting close. You need to get it in the ground if you are going to plant any. And you're going to have to fight the worms a little harder in the fall than what you do in the spring. But just stay on top of it, and they will make. Mine's growing fast. I believe it's going to come off in 55, 60 days or yep. so. All right. So lots of good stuff going in the garden. Hopefully, we'll be harvesting some stuff uh, soon coming up. And we can uh, actually show you something instead of just telling you about it. But now let's get on to our tool of the week. And this week our tool of the week is kind of a package deal we have and i'll let you hold a couple and i'll hold a couple here you hold that one and that one and this right here is what we call our garden knife combo and now these it, are very time appropriate because these are tools you're going to need to harvest the fall crops we're talking about today mm -hmm. and uh this combo comes with three different pieces here you got this knife and these knives used to come in that package and now they come they in They do this. a blister pack now, which I actually like better. This, the proper name for this knife is called a cotton sampling knife. However, that's an outdated name. And what they're using for now is they call them lettuce knives and they use them a lot in California. So for your, um, if you notice this one here has a little curve around here. And the reason it has that big curve is so you can push it to cut it instead of making a a slicing action mm -hmm. and for your, your stuff broccoli cauliflower any of your harder stem fall crops lettuces lettuces even that this right here is going to be your go-to yep love that one there right now this right here is what we call the cabbage knife and this is the standby and this is the old faithful that the farmers have used for years and years to cut cabbage with they use them in the field they use them by the hundreds by the thousands cutting cabbage because we grow a lot of cabbage out here. Both of these knives here are made in the USA and they're made by Old Hickory. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ontario Knife Company makes that particular brand, been around forever. And it's 1095 high carbon steel, so it will rust. You have to keep some oil on it, but it's easy to sharpen and it will sharpen. Now we sell this combo with this file. Now this file is what called a farmer's file because it's got a handle on it there. And these guys will carry these files to the field with them and it's double-sided on one side. On this side right here, it's double-sided. And it's uh, cut one way, we'll call one-sided on this Single side. Single cut. Single cut. So if you want, if your knife is really dull and you need to take some metal off, you want to use that double cut there. And then you want to 
turn it around and finish it off with that single cut. I'll see if I can demonstrate the way those guys do it in the field here. If I can get it up just right. Okay. So here is my single cut. They just take it and run it along through there. <coughs> and then turn it around and sharpen it this way. Sharpen's real easy. You got the file in the field to sharpen it with. So when they get a little bit dull, touch them up and get back at it. And so this one right here, besides cabbage, <coughs> what I really like using this one for is cutting those Asian greens, cutting mustard greens, stuff like that, soft leafy vegetables, stuff mm -hmm. like that. You can really get in there. This is just nice, lightweight, but sturdy knife. Both of these I use all the time. Really yep. So you get both of those in this, and it's a very economical knife. I'm not going to say cheap. It's a very economical knife, so you're not going to break the bank getting you one. I keep these out in the garden shed. Yeah, I keep one in my garden buggy, and that way I can go to them anytime I need them. So there you have it. You got your cabbage knife, or what we call the California, what we call this knife? California the knife. The California knife. And the farmer's file is in our combo. Garden knife combo. Garden knife combo. There you have it. All right. So check that out. You're definitely going to need some of those uh, coming in the fall for yep. your fall harvest. And speaking of fall harvest or growing fall crops, this week we want to talk about our favorite varieties and our favorite crops. And so we'll go through the, the crops we usually plant in fall and, uh, and mention some of those varieties that we like to plant. And the, the first one we want to talk about here is broccoli. Now broccoli is one of those things, down here especially, it can be a little tricky because if it, especially in the spring, if it turns off hot, that broccoli is going to get seedy on you quick. Yeah. And in the fall, you got to time it kind of just right here because if, if, if it turns back hot, you know, and you can't be too greedy when you're harvesting your broccoli. If you try to wait on that head to get real big, it's liable to get seedy on you and you, and you ain't got anything. If it ever blooms out yellow flowers, you have waited too long. Now the variety we like to grow is called Green Magic. And the reason we like to grow is because it is especially heat tolerant. Mm -hmm. And it grows well in the south. And that's one that we really tout a lot and one that we like to grow. Yeah, compared to something like cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, which we'll talk about in a minute, broccoli is pretty fast compared to those two. Usually 55, 60 days, something like that. It's a lot quicker than some yeah, of these and everybody loves to grow broccoli in the garden because most everybody loves broccoli. You eat it raw, steam it, however, but everybody likes broccoli mm -hmm. just about. If, we've we've had good success with blanching it and freezing yep. it as well. So uh, gr the green magic is is heat tolerant, and we really like that one. That's yep. our go-to. Now after you get that main head, that first cutting off of it, you, if you wait, you get what they call little sprouts out, and you can get some more. You can harvest it some more after that. Now you're not gonna get that big head again. But you can get you some more broccoli off from it from time to time and little what come out of the sucker areas there. So you can get more than, uh, you can harvest it more than one time. Yeah, and once you're done harvesting it, what I like to do is I like to go in there, instead of pulling them up, take my loppers, cut them off the bottom and feed them plants to the chickens. Chickens love some broccoli. They do, they do. All right, now moving on to a kind of cousin of the broccoli. Let's talk about cauliflower. Oh, cauliflower, minute. yep. Now, we grew some last year that I had never grown before, and these were colored cauliflowers. Mm -hmm. We grew the white, we grew the yellow, and we grew the purple side by side. And I'm going to tell you, I was really impressed. They do a great job. So you can't tell a whole lot of difference in these seedlings here. This is the uh, snowball variety of the white cauliflower that we like. And uh, this is a purple one. These were started a little sooner. Now the purple ones, once you put them in the ground and start growing them, they'll have more purple foliage on them, whatever. Yeah, you actually see that little bee leaf there is purple. Yeah. yeah. So these are, the purple variety is called graffiti. Graffiti. And now uh, they're really, really pretty. Yep. And I, those white ones are, are nice as well. We like both of those. With cauliflower, the thing you got to watch out for is the sun can blanch those white ones and make them look yellow. Those leaves fold over and keep that head protected till this time to harvest and then they kind of open up and that's when you get it. Yeah, and and the cauliflower, we learned this last year at the expo, we, we lost some of our purple ones. 
the heads are not as frost resistant like broccoli is. Mm -hmm. If it comes with frost, frost gets on those heads. If it's not wrapped up tight, it's, they're going to go soft on you really. Yeah, you can't have trouble worms getting inside of that that leaf canopy here in there. So you want to make sure to keep it sprayed with BT, even though you may not think you got a problem. You want to keep on some kind of schedule there because worms can get in there. Yeah, and I have seen in the past some people take rubber bands and put them around the heads so those leaves cover up the heads, protect them from frost, yeah. keep them nice and white. Yep. All right. Well, there's cauliflower, and then now onto something we did for the first time last year is Brussels sprouts. Now, we did really well with them in the fall last year. They take a lot of time. A lot Ooh, of time. you got to have a lot of patience. Now, we love Brussels sprouts. If you ain't ever had those things roasted in some olive oil, you're missing out. They are delicious. However, they can test your patience growing them in the garden. They take forever to mature. And here's a, uh, here's a Brussels sprout start we got here. Yep. We got a whole flat of these that are ready to go in the ground. Nice and pretty. Now, the uh, I can't remember the variety we grow, but there ain't but a few varieties of Brussels sprouts out there. Now, I did learn this spring, you, you can't grow them in the spring. You have to grow them in the fall down here. They won't ever make. Yeah, uh, you'd have to. You get, if you got your time, it's possible. If you got your time and perfect and had a nice, good late winter, it's possible, but you'd have to plant them early on. Yeah, my mine filled out, the, the leaves filled out, never made any real Brussels sprouts. Yeah. And um, last year on some of my late ones, I learned this works pretty good, doing some research on, on how to grow them. Once they start making the little sprouts on the side of the stalks, if you go in there and take your knife like we showed earlier and just cut the top off them plants, what that does is that's going to focus that plant's energy into making those sprouts as opposed to more leaf. And uh, you'll, you, it'll fill out yeah. that, that column because they grow on a, a right. column and... Um, They'll feel out a lot better if you cut them tops off of them once they start making. Yep. A lot of reward, but you got to put a lot into it. A lot, a lot into it, a lot into it. And that when you harvest those things, well, I like to harvest the whole stalk and leave them on there until I'm ready to eat. That bottom piece there is about like a tree trunk. So don't go out there with a puny knife from your garden. Yeah. I like to take loppers or you take you a good hatchet, real sharp machete. Yeah, work on it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so those are Brussels sprouts. And then the um, another fall crop we like a lot is kale. Kale. Kale's easy to grow. Uh, you can cut it several different times. You get a lot of bang for your buck with the kale. We like to eat kale soups. One of my favorite things to eat around here in the wintertime when it's nice and cool. But you eat kale several different ways. A lot of people do the kale chips. And we all know kale is supposed to be one of the superfoods. It's loaded with them antioxidants. And it's supposed to be real good for you. And, and it is good to you also. Now the varieties that we like to grow is the... Let's show them here. So we got three different ones here. And we've got the one in the middle here is the Lacinato or the dinosaur kale. Which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's an Italian heirloom. And that's the one, I've got some for spring that are five foot tall. You can, as long as you don't let these guys get stressed, you can harvest and harvest and harvest them. Mm -hmm. Um, the other one we like is more of the frilly kale, and this is called winter boar. Mm -hmm. You'll see some, uh, they're called darker boar, but it's kind of pretty much the same thing. You know, I'd say that's probably in the commercial, from commercial farmers, I'd say this is the most popular variety that they grow. That's the ones we see grown around yeah. here. Uh, the they most. use them for garnish also, and for years we didn't know you could eat them. But they used to garnish the plates with them back, uh, this and another variety back in the day. And now we got wheat, kale, and this is particular one here is real good. And this one will repeat harvest as well. Now I will say that the frilly varieties don't store quite as well as this Lacinato does. So this stuff right here, you put it in a bag in the refrigerator and it's good for several days. Is this a red red Russian here? Red yeah. boar, red, red boar. boar. Red boar, yep. Which is real similar to this if it's just red. Mm -hmm. Anytime you got a red or purple color in there, it's supposed to be a lot better for you on kind of antioxidants in there. So. And that one there is doesn't store as well as this one, which doesn't store as well as this. But this one is really pretty. So if you're going to grow some of that, you need to eat it pretty fresh. Mm -hmm. Whereas this now, I won't tell you, this here is my favorite right there. That's the one I grew the most of. 
I'll grow some of all of it, but I always make sure I plant more of these than I do any other. That down there is my favorite. Yeah, the lost another my favorite. Lost another, yep. All right, and then just to kind of touch on a few other things, uh, because it's so hot down here, we can't grow lettuce but in the early spring and the fall. And I've got some, uh, show them the varieties we like. Now keep in mind, we let these go a little too long, but time wasn't on our side. We just hadn't had time to get them in the garden. But these, this is some romaine right here. And uh, I can't remember if this is Paris Island or Salvius, but uh, just your standard romaine lettuce here, really good to grow. You got to be careful with the lettuce, especially romaine on the bolting. Mm -hmm. Harvest it before it bolts. But romaine is real easy to grow in our area. Yeah, and you could actually eat that mm -hmm. right there as it is, cut it and let it grow again. There's all kind of varieties out there. There's been a lot of breeding done on lettuce in the last few years to make them a lot more attractive. And here's a couple of varieties here that's a little bit different. Yep. See how that curly leaf is? Now this is not a head lettuce. This is a no, that's a butter. That's oh, it a is red, a, red butter. So head. we're gonna make a head to it, a small head, and you could carve that whole way ahead and eat it. So both of these are butter heads. And this is a green butter head. This is a red one here. You can see kind of the red tint on it. The butter heads are my favorite. Hmm. They they make a good uh, lettuce head. Gets full. The ones that don't head up nicely, the, the more frilly ones, the problem I have with them, we get a hard rain, it splashes all on yeah, them, they're not nasty. tightly bound, and they get kind of dirty. Yeah. So I, I like the head lettuces a little better. The yep. butterhead are my favorite. Yep. Um, then we've got collards, which we like growing. The, the top bunch collard, there's been a crop failure on them. Can't get them anymore. Yeah, we're here through the grapevine. They're getting ready to, to rebreed that anyway. We're here like the top bunch, too, or their, something their like that. Their genetics has kind of gotten away from them, some on that top bunch, which has been a standard for the commercial farmers around here for a while. So we've moved on to a variety called Tiger. Tiger, which is the closest thing out there to it. Nice repeat harvest collard. Uh, and you can crop them off at the bottom like some of the, the market guys do. But I like to just pick off the leaves, let them keep growing. Yep. And then we've got beets, which will be starting soon. Red beets, gold beets, make some pickled beets like mm, you had. I've become a big beet fan here lately. Yeah. Boiling things in some chicken broth, they good. And now, well, I'm going to transplant mine just because I've had better luck with it. But uh, looking forward to the beets. And then one of your favorites is this right here. Kohlrabi. Now, if you've never grown kohlrabi, you need to give you a kohlrabi a try. These two different ones that we grew is a purple and these a green. And what this thing does is it makes a ball sort of kind of like a turnip root, but it's right above the ground there. You can eat the leaves on these kohlrabi, but the main thing you're after is that ball right above the root zone there. It's kind of a weird thing, but once you grow them and get an idea, you'll say, man, I've been missing out on something. Uh, you can chop these things up, stir fry them. You can make slaw out of them. It's a little different taste, but it's really worthwhile. You don't have to have a lot of them. Mm -mm. And they'll get they'll, they'll get pretty good size. Baseball, softball yeah, size. Yeah, Karabi. So give, you, give some karabi a shot there. The purple or the green. I generally plant about half and half. And uh, they keep pretty good in the garden. You got to harvest them all at one time, so you can harvest them as you need them. But it's a it's a great plant to experiment with, and I think you'll become a big fan. And uh, the roots on those, you, you might need just some loppers to go harvest mm -hmm. those as well. But yep. shred those karabis up, make some slaw out of them, slaw dogs for the ball game in the fall. Yep. You'll be good to go there. Cabbage. We grow a of cabbage just near here. Now, the ones I like... It's not the regular old round cabbage. I like the kind of the cone heads. Right, right. They seem to have a little more flavor to me, and that's the ones I grow. I ain't never been able to grow them old big, massive cabbages mm. like they go around here. And I don't know if it's just because well, I don't put enough nitrogen yeah, into them. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yep. Uh, the, the cabbage that's grown around here, they put six to eight units of nitrogen uh, per thousand square feet on these cabbages, and that is tremendous. I didn't have no idea that... that that much nitrogen was applied to cabbages, but it is. And that's the reason they get these big old giant cabbages. Now we've talked a lot about 
growing this stuff in the fall, but we ain't really touched on why you want to grow them in the fall. Well, there's a couple different reasons there. First of all, if you grow it yourself, you know what's been sprayed on it, mm -hmm. and you, you know what it is, so you feel good about it. Another thing that most people don't know is nitrates. Nitrates is not regulated on any type of green leafy vegetables in this country, in the USA. But it is regulated somewhat in the European Union. The European Union a few years ago understood that we had some nitrate uh, poisoning going on with our greens because nitrogen runs through these greens a lot because it is water-based and it takes a lot of water with greens. So you're more apt to get nitrate poisoning through a grain than you are any other type of vegetable. So the European Union has set thresholds for nitrates in green leafy vegetables. The USA has no uh, threshold or any rules or any testing on leafy greens. So if you've ever eaten you a salad or some leafy greens and that stuff got a hold of your belly and mm. tore it up, more likely it's because of nitrate poisoning because there was too much nitrogen. The farmers put a lot of nitrogen on there because they're after a quick growth and they're after to get that crop looking pretty and get it out of the field as soon as they can. That's their strategy. However, sometimes it's not good for us. And us as home gardeners have a tendency to not put so much nitrogen there and not to pump them so much and they're a lot healthier for you. So if you get that, you buy you some greens from the store, your stomach gets tore up, nitrate poisoning. Yeah, and that's what happens with them big old cabbages. Mm -hmm. Nine out of ten times it's going to Yep. So the two main reasons is, is you know what's been sprayed on there because none of these leafy greens that you buy in the grocery store has been tested for pesticide residue. So you know what's been sprayed on there and also you don't have to worry about nitrate poisoning. That's right. That's right. So get your seed starting trays, get your pot and store, your it's seed starting time. mix. It's time. Get them going. We'll be doing a lot of succession planting. We got this round going in now. We'll start another round to go in because we can get a couple crops of broccoli off, something like that, a couple crops of lettuce. So, folks, get those seeds started and get them in the ground, and you'll have some nice stuff to eat for fall. Yep. All right. So, good talk there. Now, let's get into our Q&A segment. And for the people... This week, if we answer your question on the show, we're going to send you a copy of this nice book right here called What's Wrong With My Vegetable Garden. And I really like this thing. It's got basically every crop you could imagine in there. It tells you when to plant it, problems you could have with it, and in the back it's got kind of like this pest dictionary to show you all what the different pests and diseases look like. So real good book. If we answer your question on this week's show, yep, we'll send you one of those. We'll send you that. So let's get to our questions. Oh, one more thing. If we do answer your question, this is how you let us know what your address is, this email address. And right that here. email is on our website, on our front page of our website, if you forget where it's at. Okay. All right, so our first question is from Sylvanus. I was gonna let you say that. I, I, I think you that's practice how, that a little bit. I think that's how we pronounce his name. I apologize if it's not. And- uh, What's his last name? I would say that's Rempel. But I, I'm not one. Sylvius Ripple. Okay. I'm not 100 sure. But uh, anyway, he says, "How do we handle slash deal with slash tolerate slash exterminate?" Which is not not really possible. Nutgrass. He said it's real bad in his garden, and we've talked about this a little bit before. Can be problematic. I mean, nutgrass is one of the tough issues. There, you can aggravate it to death and get some results with it. Keep it haired. Keep it turned. Keep it cultivated and get some results. However, it can stay after you and it can be one of the most prob problematic weeds in the garden. Now, the old timers used to say you could turn your hogs in there and they'd turn that soil up and get a hold of them nuts and eat that, and that would be controlled. We don't all have access to pigs nowadays, but if I did, that would definitely be a strategy I think I would try. Yeah, from my experiences, what worked, I usually prescribe a wheel hoeing in the garden once a week. If you got a bad nutgrass problem, go to two or three times a week, alternate the teeth, the cultivator teeth, and then the oscillating hoe with the sweeps and go back and forth and back and forth. And that's called the tormenting strategy. Right, that's called aggravating it to death. And if you do that consistently throughout a season, you will eventually get if rid of If you don't give up problem. first, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> hey, it can be tough. I'm not gonna try to make a situation easier than what it is. It can be a tough one. 
Uh, you may want to rotate and think about getting you another guard spot. There's several different strategies I would look at there. But it, it's possible. It just requires some diligence. Yes, it does. And then our last question here is from David Nershel. And uh, he's wondering, and this is we get this question a lot on a customer service line. How does he decide between the double wheel hoe and the high arch? Assuming he's only wanting to get one of them, and he says he doesn't plan on using the drip tape or the cedar attachment. Now that, when somebody's asking us double wheel hoe versus high arch, the first thing I always ask them is, do you ever plan on using the drip tape layer? Because it will only work with the double wheel hoe. Yep. But in his case, he's not. So what do you have to say? I'd have to say go with the high arc. That high arc is very versatile. Uh, I'd, I'd have to go with it. If I was strictly going to use it for a cultivating tool, I'd go with that high arc. However, like you said, you know, we got some other implements that will fit that double wheel hoe. But you know what would be better? Go ahead and get you that high arc and use it for cultivating. And later on, if you see you want to get into the drip tape business, or with a, a cedar, you can always get you another one there to have you a, a backup or an extra. But for strictly cultivating, if I had to make a choice, I'd go with a heart. And, and I would dig a little deeper in that and say it depends on what you're growing. If you're growing, um, if you're growing staples, corn, potatoes, beans, stuff you're going to be healing, using those plows a lot, go with a high arch. If you're doing... Um, smaller stuff the, the double wheel hoe may be fine for you that high arch is just going to give you that versatility that you're yeah if i was get. only growing carrots and some greens yeah you could definitely and beets you could definitely get by with a little double wheel hoe we got by with it for years it does a wonderful job it just doesn't have quite the uh the spread on there or the clearances of that heart it just allows you to do a lot more a lot right. more with it all right so hopefully that uh answered your question there david and Sylvanus, send us your email and, or your address and we'll, yeah, we'll get those get, books. Yeah, we'll get you a book in the mail. And uh, just a little teaser on next week's mm. show, we got something really exciting for y'all. So I want, if everybody will go to our homepage at hosstools.com. There's a hint there. Look on the top menu there where it says wheel hose, garden cedars, garden tools, and so forth. There's a new item up there, a whole new category of products that we've never carried before. I want everybody to go take a look at that and put it in the comments if you notice what it is because that's what we're going to be talking about next week. A lot of information to share with y'all next week uh, about these new products we're bringing on. Very timely. Yep. And, uh, so really excited about that. We will see you guys next week. Have a good one.